begin uh, so everyone can get home in time or you can hang out here and we're going to have a little bit of a slideshow afterwards that shows some of Malcolm's work. So it's up to you. Um, so before I get started, I know everyone has a ton of questions, so I don't want to occupy too much of your time with my questions, even though I have a lot. Uh, but I'll, I'll just start by introducing Malcolm, because I know you got here because you read his bio on my website. I hope you read his bio on my website. So you know who he is, you saw the videos, and probably like me, you asked yourself, does someone like this really live in Calgary? And how fortunate we are to have him. Um, so my story with Malcolm, I, I taught with him at AU Arts. Uh, and when I first met him, because he's so humble, I didn't really know how special he was. And over the course of the past two or three years, I've had the opportunity to sit down and spend a lot of time and learn from him um, and, and be a better person because I get to know him. So. I wanted to share him with all of you. Um, so thank you for coming tonight because it, I think uh, Malcolm is an absolute jewel and we're very fortunate to have him here in Calgary. Um, he is, of course, as you know, from uh, Yonkers, Yonkers, New York, uh, but, but spent a lot of his time in New York. And as an artist in Calgary, we of course, we go to New York quite a, quite a bit and we make a pilgrimage down there but New York wasn't always the New York that us tourists go down there uh, for, for education, um, for the arts, et cetera. And Malcolm was part of that scene that sort of grew in New York. And, and that's why I think it's absolutely fascinating to, to learn from his experience and have the opportunity this evening to, uh, for him to share some of that. So I'm just gonna start off with some general questions and then I'll open the floor a little bit. Um, but going back to the first film, how is it that you met Fred and got involved in that group? Um, and I remember in the film, it was uh, he, he was known to say, I have a great idea. And did you ever have, were you on the other end of that phone call ever? Yes, yes. Um, uh, I was introduced to Fred by my oldest friend, uh, Marquis Davis, who was in the film. I already spelled his name incorrectly, it's M-A-R-T-I-S, <laughs> and that with an E. But um, Marquise introduced me to Fred. And um, Marquise was my oldest friend, and we considered him where I lived to be the historian of our group. He knew everything about everything, it seemed. It became a, uh, he became a, uh, an ad man, he was a, a mad man, he you know, was an ad. And um, so Fred said to me, oh, do you know Fred? Uh, he just came into town, he's living down on the Bowery. And so I said, well, I, so I, I can meet him. So we went down to, uh, to his place on the Bowery. And it was kind of, went downstairs on the first floor, the guy drunk, you know, with some falling over this big barrel of, barrel of um, wood, and burning the fire at night, you know, sitting around. That's not Fred, but that's, the, that was, that's what the Bowery looked like, basically, <laughs> an overview. And, um, so Mar and Marquise and Fred went to SIU. Fred actually was uh, majoring at the time in architecture. And um, um, what's this book called? Um, National, um, Geodesic Dome. What was that? Oh, Mr. Polo. Oh, Mr. Polo was at, was, at, uh, was at SIU when Fred was there. But both Marquise and Fred were there. And so one summer, uh, Fred was going to go to um, Canada, actually, going to, up to Montreal to stay. So he said, would you like to write a place to work? So I took over his loft, which is a very small and tiny loft on the Bowery. But that's how I, that's how the, the, the friendship developed. Um, and, and in the film, it says something about me meeting Fred and talking about his, his watercolors. But I went there one day, Fred had a long, um, folding table, and he had, was using um, Dr. Uh, what was that term? Those inks. Um, the marker? Yeah, they're not permanent, I don't think either. That's the, so Fred is painting like crazy. He has like, he has like a um, um, being at the Ford company. You know, he's knocking Fred, he's doing his watercolors. I said, what are you doing, Fred? He said, oh, I'm making money, I'm making money. So I said, oh, okay, that sounds good to me, you know. But he was, he was um, like you see in the film, he, he was actually 
um, a go getter. I mean, he. I always say you could, you could sell ice that big ice cream. He loved eating ice cream. Was <laughs> and and the last thing he did when 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 he was alive was uh, he did a he got he got a I don't know if it was a grant, but he got uh, was it Cornell Cornell University. He got Cornell University to bring all of those guys who were in the film, bring us all up to Cornell University. Um, remember, and Charlie Hayden, um, who played with Ron Ned, um, uh, um, uh, Jam Rivers, all these musicians were invited, and, they, and uh, Cornell paid for us to come there, and it was called the Renaissance Project. And um, there was um, uh, Barbosa, there was a, a photographer, a very well-known photographer, neo photographer. And that went on for three three days at uh, at uh, at Cornell with Cornell's expense. And they, then they asked everybody that they contribute their um, their papers to Cornell. So that was so Ben was a, you know he was he was making his habit. You know, that was first thing. Okay. What about a phone call? He would. Hey now, uh, I'm working on the studio. <laughs> um, would you come down and help? And I live in Yonkers, downtown Manhattan. So I drive downtown, and Fred's really not paying. Fred, you know, it was, uh, and and in Soho at the time, you could not park on the street. You had to park in a, in a, in a, uh, a parking lot, you know, in a private parking lot. So it was going to cost me money to help Fred. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Fred would do things. Fred would he, he'd fantastic. Fred said, "No, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll go for lunch. We'll go for lunch." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, okay, Fred. Okay." So Fred said. Fred would take me to this, um, there was a uh, pizza place uh, on, I think it's on 6th, some Avenue of the Americas and around 6th Street. We go there, oh no, I'll just order whatever you want, I'll order a couple of slices of pizza here, the Coca-Cola. So I ordered that up, of course, and then a couple of days, Fred, Fred calls, hey Mel, let's go out for dinner. And I said, well, where do you want to go? Oh, let's go to Raul's. Now, Raul's is not, you know, um, you can get into Raul's, you can buy something maybe for $35 at the, at the bar. Oh, no wait, come on now, let's go to the, but the check would come to me. <laughs> <laughs> so not only was I, not only was I giving Fred help, so he mentions in the film that I helped him build a loft, but I thought Fred knew about, about sheetrock, you know, about, so, so Fred said, Fred's in there with a, with, a, with a reciprocal saw cutting sheetrock. I said, Fred, that's not how you cut sheetrock. Then you just use a knife, you use a, a mat knife. Fred said, oh? And I said, no, you're supposed to be an architect. You should know this kind of nonsense. <laughs> but he said, okay, so that's, and that started us building his love. He had a 5,000 square foot studio. And um, it was home to a lot of those artists that were in this, in this studio. Yeah, he's, he, he passed. And, Two, 1995, no, 2005. He was 67 years old, but he was he was an excellent painter. He and Martins, both Martins, they're both not good at something. Else. But they were. Uh, the phone call would come. Hey, Mel, you know, I've got a good idea. Let's go. To, can you come down and uh, help me with something? Uh, Oh yeah, what do you want to do? We got about a hundred sheets of sheetrock coming tomorrow. <laughs> and we, you know, he he garnered up enough guys to carry all the stuff up, like not the not the eight foot by four foot by eight feet, but the ten footers. He'd be running over down the stairs. And I don't know if he even carried any, but I know he, he might have been wrecking the whole thing. Yeah, supervising. Yeah, supervising. Yeah. 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 And that leads me to my to my next question. What was his influence on you, uh, not just him, but being part of that group, and to a larger, larger degree, New York at that time. Um, well, all, all the uh, um, people and all those guys in, the, in that uh, James Jordan actually, the, who was sitting between Fred and uh, and Felipe, he was the. Um, Director of the New York State Council of the Arts Music Section, besides being a, a horn player. Um, everybody seemed to have something, they were all giving people. They weren't takers, you know. 
Oh, great. <laughs> the leader, the leader, the leader of the pack, you know. But they were all, um, they were all givers. They all had something to give to the, to either to Fred or to everybody else around them. Um, trying to remember. Oh well, the restaurant was owned by, by. Um, oh gosh, he was there. He was sitting right next to Fred. But um, he used to stay at Fred's house, um, and he, would, he was collecting, as because he, he wanted to build his restaurant, at Claude, was it? John Claude, John Claude. And he was, he, you'd see him every now and then, he'd have the copper pots piling up in the house, where he was get, going, gathering all the, all the things he would need for that restaurant that he had the, had the, um, the roasting. Um, and then um, I don't know Tim that well. Tim lived down in, uh, in Louisiana. In fact, uh, Bentley, who was Fred's son, I spoke to him uh, yesterday, and they had a show for Fred's work in, in down at Xavier University um, uh, this past weekend. And he, he mentioned Tim would buy a lot of Fred's work, actually. Um, and um, what else was on the panel? Uh, Marquis, Marquis was, Marquis worked for a, pub, um, a PR guy for, uh, um, uh, Marcello, Burson and Marcello, and Burson and Marcello, I, I knew Burson, it's a huge, a huge public relations firm, I knew Burson because his son went to the same prep school that I went to, and um, he bought my first sculpture. So it was sitting in his office. And, um, but Marquis probably got a job with him later on. And he was working as a PR guy for him. They all gave, and they weren't takers, you know. Um, um, uh, Tony um, moved, he lives on a, on a, on a estate in, in France. And he's working, he's, he's painting as we speak. And I used, used to see him when he came up to came to Rhode Island, he's from Rhode Island. He came up to Rhode Island and we'd, um, we'd hang out. His brother became the uh, mayor of East Providence. But he was actually, he's a really very good painter, Tony, Tony Jones. And he was a videographer, as they say in the, in the film. Um, yeah, but, but if you knew Fred, um, I'm sure he would call you up and say, you know, I got a good idea. <laughs> and, um, all we need is another hundred thousand dollars to get it. <laughs> uh, so you got a dollar, Malcolm? You know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, fantastic. so it sounds like this sort of formula was a group of people who were generous and had resources and shared their resources. And that's what and that's what um, he says. In the, in the, they all would come to his rescue. He, I mean, he he was. Um, he had a bout with one time. I remember he got. I, we talk about going walking through the mirror. And he had, a, he had a difficult time at one point, but finally he went home, came back, and, and just kept going. Yeah. But all those guys helped him, all those, all the, all those men. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so I think I'll open it up to the group if anyone has any questions, which I'm sure you do. Who would, uh, who would like to ask first? Can I ask about. Um because this is something that I just noticed when we were looking at your pieces of work too. This idea of like not knowing what's in front of you, this sort of improvisation thing that seems to happen, this collection of people get together and, and, um, and, and Fred goes on and is able to continue his journey. And you have this sense when I look at your pieces, there's like these passage through one space to another and then to hear your story about just heading out to Europe and then suddenly you're in a, this incredible new musical band is there this this sense of this improvisation that you don't necessarily have to know what the outcome is going to be but rather you're sort of listening all the time to what's happening around well, I, I usually um, work with music. 
I like to paint with the music playing. And um, I, I think the key factor for me is I, I, I have an idea and sometimes I let the idea become, okay, I'll give you an example. I, uh, right now I, I have some paintings at, at the studio uh, where I've just poured paint onto a canvas and I'm watching the paint move on the canvas and I'll sometimes put a block of wood underneath it to change the direction the painting is going, where, 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 the, where the paint's going. And um, it is improvisation and also, I think I'm also, um, classical, <laughs> class, I mean, it's, it, there's, I'm waiting for something to happen and I can stop whatever action is going, but I think it's all improv, improvisation. And then, but that's not the, that's just the initial, um, the initial statement. And then from there, I, I, I'll put the painting away, or just put it up on the wall and see what it's telling me to do next. That, that is only on abstract work. I mean, I, I also paint um, figurative and, and landscape. But the idea uh, for me is, I want the work to tell, well, that's what I tell my students all the time. The work is gonna tell you what to do. And there'll be a conversation. Mm -hmm. And the conversation is telling me, oh, well, maybe Malcolm, you, know, you need to do this or you need to do that. Maybe you need to go back and gesso it out like a friend of mine does over there. <laughs> but but uh, you need, you, you know, there's something that this painting is telling me to do. And um, I have two I have, I have, I have paintings that I, where I put down this, um, this black um, pigment, and then I realize there can be something else going on with these two panels where, where the, where the, what's the, um, where the accident needs to have control. So I paint back over that, or I include the accident or the improv with something that I call, what I call structure. And that will give me the, the new painting. That will be the, how the painting will start to exist. Um, I've, been, I've been working on a set of paintings called um, um, uh, the Damdemics. It's damned if and damned. <laughs> And the Damdemics are were, were they 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 started because my manager said we're going to go to New York we're going to do a, we're going to do a residency in New York do a couple of these good color drawings we'll take them we'll take them to New York we'll either make them into a poster or we'll make them into T-shirts so I started in, in March of uh, 2020 and then the venue called up and said we're canceling your show because of the pandemic. Um, I painted this image, not the image, but I painted the Damdemics for um, 40, I did 40 of them, between, you know, four by six inches, there were 40 of them between March and August, and I did two large ones. And then I got an offer to have the show in Aspen, Colorado. But the, where I'm going with this is that these, these, these images started off as just these two images, and then all of a sudden, it, it's like uh, I can do it. Okay, it's like a, it becomes a habit almost. And all of a sudden, oh God, I got to do a couple more of these damn damn things. <laughs> I put seven up, and I'll start. I put seven clean pieces of paper. The 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 actual control mechanism is I put a circle down for each one of these, and that's how they all start. They all start with a circle, and from there I can improvise. How they're gonna what they're gonna look like in that point, and then then they're there, and they're there, and, and I I haven't stopped. That's the problem. I, I get you know, like, I, I, I gotta stop <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Take these away from me. <laughs> so yeah, so that, I hope that answers the question. Yes, yes, yes. I have a follow up question. So so to start the conversation, do you have to have something so that the circle? Is that just like you need the first word to come out and something to react to? 
Is, is that why you need something to begin with? I'd say yes. I, on, on this series of works, and I don't even know how I, I don't even know how I put down the first circle. I just know that that's what I said to myself. I, said, I don't want the paper said put a circle here, or if I said I'm going to put a circle and see what happens. And um, they they just started going. I, I put seven. I have a particular video. I put I'll put seven pieces of paper four by six inches down. I'll draw circles on each one. I'll move the circle from center to left or right or something on the page, and then I'll it, oh it becomes automatic to what I'm putting down. I'll just I'll just start drawing on each circle. And in fact, I'll even move. I won't I won't um, I won't finish one. I'll move to the next one and put something on, and I'll go back and forth until I finish them. You know, and I usually do seven at a time or six at a time. And um, but the initial you know, there's a friend of mine who kept saying, hey, "I like those so much, now can we do some more?" But I, I, all of a sudden it came to mind, like, well, "Do I want to do any more?" You know. So what happened when I, I when, the, when I finished, when the uh, fourteen came back. So I said, oh no, what we'll do is we'll do the duo darling dem dem. <laughs> so the duo darling dem dem became two of these images on each page. So, you know, maybe it'll be the trio of the four <laughs> But right now, and I said, I said to my friend, I said, Bill, I said, no, I don't want to do anymore. I want to stop. And, and, it's, and because I keep thinking, and I did, I did, I started another project in the meantime to try to move me to the to a new place. I mean, I, I don't like the idea of being stagnant. And I don't know if you're stagnant doing one thing. As long as it, as long as the, the um, as long as the, uh, the paintings keep changing, the, the, the first painting doesn't look like the last painting. So, and I haven't run out of, I haven't run out of, uh, uh, out of RAM yet. <laughs> it just keeps rolling along right now. You know, but yeah, I'm still enjoying it. Put it that way too. That's the main thing. And I remember in the video, um, uh, speaking to Ken, that was the, the improv was a big thing also with the music. So with the music, where does that start? If with the image it starts with a shape potentially, with the music, where, where does the conversation start? Well, as Jackie said, you go there yeah, like a laboratory, and um, and all, and we can sit there. Somebody start playing by themselves, you know, some play, flute or something. In fact, there's a whole section of of, uh, of uh, canned music that's called EFS, Ethnological Forgery Series, and it's it's somebody playing like the like the gagaku from uh, you know, from Japan. Or, Somebody playing the blues. Uh, Jackie could play trumpet too, playing the blues. But the um, and I think I said this. I don't know if it's in this in that movie, but we put five musicians. Actually, there were six at the, at the beginning. Um, different backgrounds. Um, all wanting to make some noise. And without anybody saying I'm the leader. And then. Like Jackie, you know, throw in the can, put the heater on, you know, like a can of beans or something. You put, put, the, put the heater on, avocado. Put. It's like not even melting. I'm, I'm, I'm melting of ideas that actually come from the people playing. I mean, we'd sit around. And they say, oh, yeah. I did a, and I, I was on part of the early riser at the group, but. Um, we we would meet at Ermin Ermin Hildegard's house, and um, we have breakfast together. And that's like at eight o'clock. No, I guess nine o'clock in the morning. And we'd sit there, and it, 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 we're young, so we, you know we can drink wine for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'd go we go out to the castle, and on, in the castle it looked like it, it did in the in the video. I mean, it was in disrepair, but you go to the castle and on the first floor of the castle was a big cocoon, a, a big cathedral, like a big fur, not a furniture, what do you call it, like a, like 
get here. And there'd be just these uh, like briquettes that put them in there in the wintertime. And we'd just sit there and uh, I, 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 okay, I remember the first, the, the, the first, so I think my father came out and yelled at me. And um, that might be the guy that finds himself, so I'm going to turn up on the microphone and start screaming. And, um, and then the, and somebody said, oh, that, that'll work. And, but the thing was, I used to write the stuff after I did it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I had no idea sometimes. I just get up there, like um, the uh, song, um, well, She Brings the Rain, she, she Brings the Rain was a song. Uh, I don't think there's any drum in She Brings the Rain. And Mickey and I went out to the studio and he just started playing and I just started thinking this is a good idea for a song, um, but it was, and, and it, it was, somebody would have something to say on the instrument, and then everybody else would say, oh, I want to have something to say with that, you know, and um, um, sometimes it was, uh, there was a, a piece called, um, uh, you do right, which is the one, it's one side of the monster movie the album. It it went on. It, it, we started playing, and I know I, I left the studio through a window <laughs> with Mickey Colony to go get some worst and some beer, and they continued playing till like we got back. <laughs> And I just jumped back there and like kept going. <laughs> it lasted, I don't know how long it lasted, but the, the, the strange part about it was when they went to take the, the it was an open reel, so there's no plate on the top. So Hogan went to take the plate off the uh, play box machine and it rolled across the floor, open, it, a part of the music was rolling across the floor, <laughs> which I, I think there's, but Hogan was, Genius and cutting, he was Schmidt, you know. He could make it, he could find some way to make it work. But I remember, but that's like two hours. We walked back in there like an hour and a half to two hours later, and they're still playing the same song. <laughs> and so we said, okay, it must be, you must go like this. <laughs> <laughs> Once I was blind, but now I see. Yeah, but it was, it, it was like that a lot of the time with Ken. Um, I, and another thing is, I don't usually talk about Ken anymore. Because um, um, that was the past. Anyway, but we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting to sort of hear how the art and the music relates, right? And some, like maybe how they group together and how your approach. Well, I think I, I, the point before, I think that when I, when I paint and hear, I think music actually suggests something to me um, on the abstract, on the abstract thing. Um, I think it's, I think, yeah, I think music and art, you know, I think uh, those two things actually meld to me. It could be classical music, I don't care what music it is, you know, but um, um, just to hear those sounds. I mean, I, I, I uh, always think that people should try to paint the colors that they hear, you know, and that's one way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and for me, I think of sound as being abstract because it's not referring to anything outside of itself. Whereas a word, it refers to something outside of itself as does a representation of a car. Do you have that same sort of separation? That, or, or when you have a, a vocal, is it, is it only the sound of it that you're concerned about, not so much what it refers to outside of itself? Well, the, um, there's a thing that I, thing I said in one of the songs, I said, the action hears the sound. And um, I, I, um, I think words, I, I like words. And I, um, I, um, I used to write when I was in, First year of college, second year, I used to write, I used to love writing. But I always thought that, well, there's one song in, in the, that played tonight, 
um, it's called Girl from Marseille. And the, um, the whole, the track actually brought about the, the vocal. And um, it, became, it was invented at the time. When, they, when we started playing, I just invented the, I invented the whole thing. Not the, not, the, not the instrumental part, but I invented it. Because I could hear it. I could hear the, 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 the music was telling me this is what this is supposed to sound like. This is the kind of idea of this trip across from Marseille to Paris. I mean, that's the sound I was hearing. And it might only be my sound. It might only be somebody else, somebody else might hear this and say that that's their trip from Lethbridge to Edmonton or something. But at that time, that sound that they were making the band was actually that actually uh, Girl from Marseille is not is not a can song. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It's Tenth Planet. Tenth Planet. No, it's Tenth Planet. It's a Tenth Planet song. Sorry. But on the same side of that is that that music generated the actual lyric. And um, I'm trying to remember. Can has a piece called Thief. And, and, but the idea is the, the uh, when they talk about the hallway at the castle, the, the bird in the hallway, I sang in the hallway of that piece. And the whole idea for that one was, I still think it's a sound. I mean, it's, it's a, what was it? Boom, 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 boom. It's, it was the sound. The sound created this, I don't know if it's a memory for me or, because the, the lyric is, um, And so the, the lyric for Thief is about uh, Christ on the cross, actually. And also, um, why would some, because there's supposed to be a thief on the cross at the same time as a crucifixion. But the idea of, the, the whole idea for that piece was that, um, that the new, new Daily News in New York always was portraying at the time of the Giuliani's administration, they were portraying these African American guys on the West Side Highway who were doing the window washing. Um, they become they become the the, uh, the thief. They become they, they're not thieves, but they become the idea of why are we pointing to that particular group. Of that particular person as the thief, which then relates related back to the fact that in fact the, the fact that the, the chronology the chronology of this is not correct, but the the idea of the thief being someone else other than than a real thief was the was the key factor, and um, but I always believe that the music is generating something in me, and it, it wouldn't generate the same thing in you. But it will it generates it might as I said before a lamb. It might be my history and things that I feel, I'm sure it does, that make this make that music work for me in a way. Um, there's a tune that was never published. Um, you know, it was published actually on the on the um, White Columns album. Um, and uh Erman Schmidt's playing keyboard at that on the original. And there, we don't have any, there's no lyrics, there's no, no, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no one has said anything about what we're going to do, which is what Daphne and Ken. And this is at the studio down in, he, he had a studio down in the south of France. And Ermin starts to play keyboard, and he's in a room, we, we had cables running from the main house into the studio, but the piano is in the, uh, in the main house. And Ermin's playing something, and I hear this, and all of a sudden it becomes, oh, that's perfect, this, this idea I have. And so it becomes a, a lyric, it becomes another sound. The, the band joins in, the, the band, they, would, they were never, there was never a time when they would say, oh, that doesn't work. Because they always felt that 
it might not work when we're doing it right now, but give it to Hoga, and Hoga will figure out how to make it work. You know? <laughs> and so it, it, it was, um, yeah, that's the thing. But it, it was a laboratory. It was a laboratory of creating, creating sounds and delivering <laughs> percussion. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Sounds good to hear. Yeah. Good. Who has another question? Jess. Yes. Um, I was going to say I noticed um, in your paintings, and then when you were talking about the, the two, the idea of two kept coming up. And I just, I think I just noticed that because compositions, when there's like the, the two sides, really like stand out to me because they're, they're, I don't know why they're so shocking to me. Um, and then you're talking about you did like two pieces in the, um, the, the dual, dual yeah, dual. yeah. And I, I was just wondering if that was something that you kept coming up. <laughs> um, well, well um, I have a series called Pages. I'm basic, I mean, and in Pages, um, um, I was, um, Trying to look at the paintings as if they were um, inside of a, inside of opening a book up, and I there's four large four large pieces that are um, um, four foot high, eight foot long, seven and a half foot high, and they're on paper, and so I was trying to um, not trying to I did um, these paintings that actually. Are supposed to be read like a book, so that from left to right. But and and I, and I never got to the point where because I, I kept thinking, well, what about if I was in China? How would I read? How would this be read? Or if I was in uh, in Persia, how do you read? So the the idea of that the, the two halves, um, European style metrics, that became important to me for for how to. Uh, create create a painting, create paintings, and um, I think in that video of views, I think there's a couple that's shown here that are that have the, the two sides to it. And then there's a big usually there's a there's a mark that sweeps across. It's supposed to be the, the, the page turner, uh, so that you're on the left, and this 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 sweep is supposed to bring you to the other side of the canvas. Um, and I, I've, con uh, uh, well, I've been doing these diptychs lately, which I guess is sort of like a bouncing off point from where I was doing the pages. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, I think it, 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 my wife is a big book person, so I think I had to do a lot to eliminate that this pages just became, a, the image of books became more, Odd too in the, in the paintings. I mean, it's a. I was thinking when when we were watching the reviews, and there's one that has a um, a green sort of a, it's white with a green edge to it. It goes across the page, and I kept saying, "Why did I do that?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 in retro, I, I sort of said I didn't want it to be. I wanted I wanted it to be funky. I didn't want it to be so. so um, uh, characteristically as the painting was. I wanted something to sort of shock me also, shock, shock the, the viewer. Uh, yeah. Cool. Anyone else with a question? We'll all come to you after this. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, so this is another one just to, with, for, to go back to, 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 to the thing about his work. Do you think that that collection of people that were around him do you think that he he would have um, been so prolific of his work if he didn't have that group of people? Mm 
Well, that's a good question. Well, there's a lot, of, as far as I can tell, there's a lot of energy that they brought to the table. Um, all of those, like, all of those um, people, and this, they, they all had, um, as I said before, they were all givers. And um, I don't know, I think, but, but also New York, though. Mm -hmm. New York in itself, I mean, there was so much going on in New York. Where he lived on, on, on 120 Worcester, um, in walking distance, in fact, we would do this on Saturdays. Um, there was, uh, I think it was 420, I think it was 420 West Broadway. 420 West Broadway, um, Costello, Leo Costello Gallery, Paul Cooper. There was, a four, there was four floors of galleries in that, in right two blocks away from his house. Um, uh, across the street from him was another, I mean, the whole, the Soho area at the time was vibrant with, with people. Every Saturday, the place would fill up with uh, people coming to see the art, uh, coming to hear the music. There, it was so, um, it, yeah, vibrant, I guess is the right word. And so I think the energy that was there, I don't know if he could have, uh, Done it without those guys, but the energy was there also without that group. I mean, um, there are musicians uh, like Arnett Combs across the street, um, um, Jordan, who was in the movie, who's the, the uh, New York State Council of New York. I mean, they were all around. And, and, and then, like his, um, 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 what was the young man's name? Uh, the guy, uh, Jerry. Jerry, yeah, thank you, Jerry. I mean, this young man, you know, Fred took him under wing, you know, under his wing, and um, this the, there, there was so much energy, so much creativity going on. I mean, um, Fred, uh, this is the thing about China. So Fred had gone. Fred was represented at one point by Marlboro Gallery. Marlboro Gallery was handling um, um, English artists. Um, Bacon, Frank, Frank Bacon. Bacon. Yeah, yeah. So he was he was involved in gallery uh, with with the big guys, right? They, and they would not they would not back him. They didn't they wouldn't back him to go to China. Um, uh, and also at the same time, there was another artist that came up at the same time as Fred, and in, in, the, in the gallery, and they the pricing of Fred's work was like twenty five percent less. And they came at the same, the same age. So there was a lot of things going on in the, in the um, art business that was not helping Fred, but was helping, uh, and it's a, it, was a, it was actually a, a reference to the fact that the other person was, was white. Mm -hmm. Fred was white. But, uh, but I think that those those, those um, men was were really helping him. I mean, they were in the studio painting for him. I mean, like I said, at the beginning of the of the uh, movie, he said, "An artist, you know, you call you an artist because every day you get up and you take a paper and you start painting, mm -hmm. you know." And that's what he would do. He would um, he would paint every day. It was just like the thing that we're talking about, like the music side of. Uh, the piano thing, that's how every day you go to the studio and sing or play some instrument. So yeah, he was, and, and all the, all the um, a, a couple of, well, only, only Tony Ramos is a painter, but uh, he's still painting. So I guess, but there was, there's a huge amount of energy. And, and, and as I said, in that Soho area, um, there's musicians, there's a, a huge amount of painters at that time. This is before um, um, Bed Bath and & Beyond and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and all yeah. those guys moved into Soho, you know. Yeah. So, because like they said, downstairs on the, down, it was kind of funny, because downstairs at Fred, there's a guy who's making, uh, making um, duct work for, you know, for buildings, you know. Like, you know these small factories. Um, New York at that time was quite uh, quiet. It was quite beautiful. You know, so you 
could find a law. I lived, I, I, my law firm was on, I was in NoHo, uh, which is just above, it's north of Houston Street. And I lived in one of the, what was it? Tro what's that? Tro I forget the address. But I lived on, I went to live on, on 11th Street. I forget my address. And um, I had a loft that was paid $300 a month. It was uh, 1,400 square feet. Raw, raw space. Um, Fred, in fact, Fred built my built my uh, my my bed, my uh, loft bed. Um, I think it was like a plumbing situation. Built the loft bed, and uh, I lived there for I think three years, four. In fact, there's a picture of me standing in front of these tubes in one of these places, and that was for Harry, Harry Belafonte, um, a woman by the name of Kati, had asked me to. Uh, help her do the stage, the stage design that would go to these different schools. So I went, I, those tubes were from these uh, fabric companies when they had bolts of, bolts of cloth. So I brought, was bringing on loads of these tubes to the, to the studio and weaving them to make a screen so that uh, the actors could go behind the screen and change clothes and stuff. Mm. And so, um, and, and, and Kati James, who was the wife of, uh, of um, Harry Belafonte's musical director, um, and so they hired me to help out on this on this project. You know, so it, so that it, at the time there's so much energy, not only energy but people who could help to you know to, to get work. And it wasn't it wasn't you were weren't so you know that was the six degrees of separation. You weren't so far from someone that could possibly help you during that time, you know. And there's a bar scene going on in Soho. I mean, bars would pop up, artist bars would pop up when, when nobody, you know, like, uh, like this place, all of a sudden there'd be a, a bar in here. <laughs> and, and, and artists would be coming in, I mean, just like, just walk, it, it, like they'd be there for like six months. And then they would move somewhere else and somewhere else. It was, um, it was a fascinating time. So that was after you came back from Europe? Is that no, no, that this is, that that's a good question. Or, um, where was that? <laughs> <laughs> is that after <laughs> camps or was that before camps? When you were at that lot? When, oh no, that's after, that's, uh, yeah, uh, 19, that's 1970, 1970 to 73. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and then the landlord figured out, <laughs> He figured out because I, I I put a bathroom in my in my loft, a wooden paneled shower, you know, great place, six burner stove, and I had glass shelves, and, you know, and then uh, the landlord came in and said, "Oh man," and then, uh, <laughs> and, then and then he left, and my rent started to go up. <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, "This might not this might be the way in the future. Maybe this is a." And in fact, I write about I write a poem. Poem about uh, what is it, the Connecticut cuts and the Jerseyites. It's um, it's about uh, how um, the uh, land investors, the land developers, said, you know, this loft idea, we could create some walls down here. You know, uh, you were paying three. We could put the rent at three thousand. You know, and in fact, I was I was walking past my place about two or three years ago. I was paying three hundred dollars a month. I think it went up to three seventy five. The most I paid, and that was in that was in uh, uh, nineteen seventy three seventy three. And then I was walking by there about forty years ago. On, 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 I want to say on eleventh, on eleventh, eleventh Street. And then I, uh, this guy was walking in and out of it. I said, "Well, how much is the rent on that?" On that? Oh man, that's eight thousand dollars a month. <laughs> I said, "What?" <"Fine." laughs> yeah, well. You know, you realize that that it's a change. So a lot of loft. This is 19, 1970. So lofts were going for like like nothing. They had raw space. Fred's studio. I don't know if I mentioned in the, in the video. Fred's studio was five thousand square square feet raw space, five hundred dollars a month. <laughs> okay. And at the end of it, because he had to leave quickly, it was five thousand dollars a month. And um, yeah, the, 
the artists, so we're gonna see the artists come in and, and get the raw space, create, you know, get a nice space going, get things going, and then the developer comes back behind them and says, oh, you know what? This would make a great place. You have to leave, <laughs> and um, we'll make something out of it. Right, you know. So that's a, who was your Malcolm? Who was your inspiration before you left for France? Before you went for Europe? Who My dad. Who, who who was your greatest? My dad. And then other than that, like I mean, obviously you went down to the French shop, saw your dad doing all this silk screening stuff, your foreign ink, and all that sort of stuff. But who who was who, who else? Who else was like a big influence um, in your? Well, life? one of my one, two of my teachers, Murray Wright. And Boston University, he was a, uh, he was a, uh, Mary Reich introduced me to um, Arshil Gorky, um, who I, um, well, was it Arshil Gorky, and then also, um, well, Ar Arshil Gorky, I think, is the, my, my biggest, that's what Murray introduced me to. Um, I just loved his work. I have a painting of uh, actually of, um, of Murray, which is sort of similar to Arshul Gorky's work. And then you get a chance to work with these guys. No, the, he's a professor. Yeah. At the time. No, I I um, I didn't work with uh, Murray. Was Murray was a, 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 an artist that was very um, loving to his stu students. I mean, he would have you come to his house and, and talk about painting and. Um, Introduce you to other. In fact, he introduced me to um, um, oh God, um, he started painting in New York, but not in Chicago. Um, I forget his name. I, I keep, but some major painters he introduced me to in New York. Yeah, well, this is the yeah, school period. Yeah, this yeah. is 60, 62 to 66, 67. Um, but he was inspired. And then, oh, um, uh, Walter Murch. Walter Murch was an influence. Walter, well, I love Walter Murch's teacher. He said nothing. He actually <laughs> said nothing in class at all. I mean, he was the most silent professor I had ever met. But he would come around and he would make a mark on your canvas to say, like, Say the shoulders off, for instance, and he would do it, and he wouldn't say anything. Just go in on the, and that would be that was it. I mean, and that's what when you're supposed to you're supposed to follow that. That was the correct way to show that shoulder. You know, but but uh, Walter Murch took me up to Dartmouth to see some shows in Dartmouth. Um, but I, yeah, he was with with Murch and and. Uh, and Boston University was pretty insane, though. I mean, at the time, I was my, my first, my, my first um, time in a, really an art school, I was, you know, I got accepted there. But I remember being in the figure drawing class, and uh, I took, I, I think I've used this in our, my classes here. Um, so, um, He would there'd be 30 people, 35 people in the classroom, and he would remember everybody's name. And I said, Oh man, that is a trick that I need to learn. <laughs> so I try to use it in my classes where I can figure out who, you know, just and also what it does is it actually the communication of that actually makes you realize who people are in your classroom. They're not just a name. You figured out, you know, you figure out something about them. Anyway. Um, 
But my father, still, my father, because my father would say that when he was a silk screen printer, he was a historiographer. And um, when it came time to work, because um, I, I worked in a number of silk screen houses uh, up until I went to uh, Cal State, I worked in a lot of, I went, worked in uh, some uh, fine, art printer, fine art silk screen places in Manhattan. And then I worked in uh, Los Angeles as a printer. I was doing fabric, fabric printing. Well, I was in the art department, but, but um, I think my dad was really, he was king. Because he would buy, he would buy, the, buy the supplies when I was younger. And uh, he taught me that, uh, he's almost like a principal. He taught me that if you're gonna paint, you better paint, don't be sitting around and looking at it. Because <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of times, you know, oh yeah, let me get back there and look at the thing. No, do something. Well, that's okay, but you better do something. You have to sit down, get off your ass, and put something on the canvas. <laughs> you know? And it doesn't make any difference if it works or not. You know, it doesn't, just get it on there, and then you'll figure it out later. You'll figure out. Um, yeah, I, I know. But I, but I find that uh, the, uh, it's a journey. It really is a, uh, it's a wonderful journey. And, and, and you, if, you, if you really want to do it, you know. Um, and if you get stuck, it's like anything else, like being in the snow, you know. You get stuck, you push yourself out, get the hell out of there. Work harder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You gotta get out of the snow. You know, you gotta, yeah. you know. It's, uh, anyway. Cool. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, thank you so much, Malcolm. This has been a fantastic <laughs> And like I said, I'll, uh, we'll project a few of Malcolm's images and stuff, just so you have a little bit more context. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, let me turn this. I didn't.